Welcome back. All right, so a top 10 list for all you fine people on the internet. Uh, and we're, we're going to look at 10 things that I think we've seen through these playoffs or 10 things we've learned through these playoffs. Uh, some of these are topics I discussed during the regular season or I've discussed at various points during the playoffs. At the bottom of the board are the 14 teams that have been eliminated. Um, the Rangers, the Dallas Stars, the most recent examples. Uh, and I've, I've arranged it by who had the most wins to who had the least wins in these playoffs. So... Yeah, um, if you're a fan of one of those 14 teams on the board, you've been told your team sucks, they're not good enough, they're never going to win a Stanley Cup, this is why they're awful, their team captain probably is pretty bad, their goaltending is not good enough, their coach sucks. It's just all 14 teams are just, that's and that's how that works. Even though these playoffs have been close, even though these playoffs have featured so many one-goal games, as soon as the series is done, you're told your team's terrible. Um, and since three of the 14 teams on the board are ones that I root for, yep, yeah, I've, I've seen that with all three. Boston's never winning, Dallas never winning, Vancouver's never winning. Got it, cool. All right, cool. All right, that being said, uh, we'll jump into the top 10 list now of things we've seen in these playoffs. Um, and, and this first one is something I talked about late in the season. So after I went and saw the LA Kings against the Vancouver Canucks and I watched the Kings basically just shut the Canucks down and shut down that attack. It's something I had noticed in games recently anyways, but watching it live, I was like, wow, you know, this this blanket defense, um, it's kind of boring to watch. And I, I get the feeling like because it's working against some of these higher scoring teams, we're going to see more of that. And I think the playoffs, we have absolutely seen it a lot. Both Florida and Edmonton have played a very defensive style of game. Yes, they have offensively minded players, but basically how they get here is fantastic defense and low event hockey. Low event hockey has become more and more of the storyline. Uh, these playoffs haven't been about beautiful end-to-end -end goals, three-on-two rushes where a guy buries it. It's been about grinding the game and and just keeping those chances to an absolute bare minimum where some teams can go an entire game without an odd man rush because of the defense that's being thrown at them. 1-3-1 uh, one, one defenses, just generally the trap appears to be back. Um, and so defense better than offense. We'll see if that runs over into next season. There may very well be a team or two that says, you know what, we didn't play that style in 2023-2024 and it cost us and so they'll start playing that style of hockey next year. It is a copycat league, as I've mentioned before. Uh, which brings me to number two. And it's something I kept saying last night. Kept saying last night, all the time. Shots don't matter. How many shots a team has means absolutely nothing. It doesn't tell you who's playing better. It doesn't tell you who's actually in control of the game. Shots just don't matter anymore. We are, we are now in a league where... A team might get a couple of goals and be up and then go, all right, and then they just play that defensive shell of a game, making sure the goalie sees the puck, making sure that those shots are from a distance, and so they don't care if it's 40 or 50 shots, if they're from the blue line or from the outside or from sharp angles. As long as their goalie's playing well, it's fine. The shots don't don't matter. So every time I heard that last night, like, oh, the Oilers aren't getting shots, I'm like, shots don't matter. They no longer matter in the National Hockey League. I... Uh, you know, it's something that I track all the time when I do the 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 play by play all the way through the regular season, and everything. But these playoffs have got me thinking: Do the shots actually mean anything anymore? It doesn't feel like they do, right? Uh, high danger chances is a better uh, way of looking at it, and it just doesn't feel like some of these teams with 35, 40, 45 shots get a lot of those from in close. They're not really high danger chances. Um, one debate that we've had when it comes to hockey is. And I'm going to put can be, because not in every single case. But depth, fourth lines. Fourth lines can be key to a series. Uh, a good forechecking fourth line. And again, Edmonton has this. Florida has this. Fourth lines that can go out there and, and get a little bit of run of play at the other end. And, and pin the other team down a little bit. Maybe against the more talented players, get them frustrated. And then during that pressure that they're generating, they ch change out. The star players come onto the ice and now they've got the puck in the offensive zone and they've got a tired team. So uh, fourth lines can be really, really important in these playoffs. Uh, and it's not just about production because very often people will say, well, they don't produce goals. Well, no, but that's not what they're there for. They're there to change momentum. They're there to forecheck and just try to wear the other team down and just frustrate the opposing team. Again, 
so that when they go off and the star players come on, it's primed for a potential goal for their team. Uh, number four on the list, and I'm, I'm just going to say, because I keep hearing about this, and, and, and it's it's mentioned a lot. Yeah, I know. I'm using my finger. I know. Yeah, the eraser's right here, actually. Uh, the question of momentum from game to game. How many times in these playoffs have we seen, hey, these teams are playing tonight. The last game, this team played really, really well. So will they carry that momentum over into this game? No. Um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you would see that momentum go through. But with the amount of coaching, with the amount of, of intelligence players have playing the game now, just from knowing the game a little better, um, and, and I, I'm not saying that to insult previous generation, it's, it's just the amount of preparation that goes into the games now is crazy. You know, it doesn't feel like they just go out and play a game and have fun. Now it's there. there is an absolute game plan from one game to the next, and teams are good at adjusting, but... Yeah, momentum from one game to the next just isn't really there. Watch for that to get mentioned a lot in the final. Whoever wins game one, you're going to hear, are they going to be able to carry the momentum over into game two? And the answer is no. They can't even carry on the momentum in game. How many two-goal leads have we seen just completely destroyed in these playoffs? Uh, now, what's interesting is we have the Florida Panthers who finished first in their division. The Edmonton Oilers finished second in their division. But is there really home ice advantage in the playoffs? Like, And it feels like this year we're back to road teams winning a lot. And and I know the stats are there. The road teams win a lot. I think it's easier to play on the road than at home, especially when you're doing this. I think there's more pressure on a team to hot dog a little bit and perform for the fans when they're at home. There's a little more pressure. They hear that cheering. You want to give the crowd a reason to be excited. And by doing that, and by really trying to force the offense, the team that's playing the defensive game, they get the transition chances. They get, you know, the momentum in game. And uh, maybe they allow the first eight shots and then they score on their first shot. So home ice advantage hasn't really been a thing. Uh, even though I will say Florida and Edmonton, two of the better teams in the NHL. And um yeah, they've both had home ice during these playoffs, but it hasn't really been a key thing to them to them getting it. Uh, which means which means this, um, or brings me to this. All right, now I'll use the eraser. So when I get a letter ahead of myself, which is ironic because uh, I'm writing the word ahead. So yeah, writes its writes its own joke. So during these playoffs, I, I generally did not celebrate if a team I rooted for was up by two because I know better. Uh, two goal leads don't mean anything. So while home ice advantage doesn't necessarily mean a lot in these playoffs, two goal leads don't seem to mean anything either. Uh, I did feel like towards the end of the series for both Florida and Edmonton, who are going to play each other in the final, that that changed a bit, that we started to see it actually matter a little bit more. They had a lead. They were pretty good at holding on to it. But again, there was still that feeling of, hey, you know, if uh, if you get a goal here and there, it, it could change. Uh, and so, yeah, it is that dreaded two-goal lead. It's been referred to as the dreaded two-goal lead for as long as I can remember. It just feels like it's even more of a dreaded lead than it was before. Which brings me to number seven. So, during the regular season, Connor McDavid's been excellent. And I remember the season where they just played uh, in the division, the 56-game schedule in 2021. McDavid put up a ridiculous amount of points, and the comments were, well, that's against Canadian teams. McDavid couldn't do that against, you know, really good American teams. Uh, McDavid's now going into the Stanley Cup Final. He is leading the playoffs in scoring. Uh, I, I think we can basically say, you know what, he's arrived. He has, he has cemented his position as... A, an absolute first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, he's going to hit 1,000 points very early next season. Already 1,000 points is insane. Uh, and McDavid is, I still think, the best player in the league. And there are a lot of people who, who may not be big McDavid fans. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and I, I've never said that I'm I'm like a huge fan of his, just that he's, he's the best player in the league. So I have a couple of jerseys with 97 on them. 
because, yeah, he's the best player in the league. And part of the reason why I'm willing to get McDavid jerseys with Edmonton is I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he's going to spend his whole career there. And if they win that Stanley Cup, A, it cements this right here, and B, I think it means that he and Leon Draisaitl will stay in Edmonton because they're going to want to win more Stanley Cups. So then you win that first one, then you want more of them. Um, also, this one here. Uh, Florida doesn't get rattled. I haven't seen Florida once in these playoffs um, lose lose a step or lose focus because of something that happens somewhere on the ice, because of something players say. I have not seen anything that has rattled Florida at all in these playoffs. <clears throat> now, Edmonton, I think, is a different beast than what they've dealt with in the East so far. Uh, but again, until that Stanley Cup final, you just never know. Maybe, maybe somebody does sweep this series. Who knows? But uh, the Panthers haven't got rattled. I think part of it is Paul Maurice. I think Paul Maurice, his his coaching style has matched up with Florida better than I think it ever did in Winnipeg. Um, I've seen people say, oh, well, you know, and Winnipeg just shows how bad Winnipeg is. I've seen that here and there. But I think it just shows that Maurice's personality is suited to that team. Uh, and that is important. It is important to have a coach that has a really good chemistry with his players, knows exactly where to put them. Um, they trust him, he trusts them, that kind of thing. And with Paul Maurice and the Florida Panthers, at no point in these playoffs have I felt like they're they're concerned. Um, have I felt like they're you know things are going against them, so therefore they're getting out of their game. They don't. Doesn't matter if they're down in a series or in a game. They do not change their system. They have no doubt in that system. And it shows the faith the players and management have in one another. Uh, which brings us to number 10. We mention it every year, and I'm, I'm going to mention it here. It's the lack of power plays. It's not just that. It's that referees don't seem to want to call penalties. I understand not wanting to influence the outcome of the game, but if you're, if you're letting it slide so that there's so much that's going uncalled, first off, it just it means that the comment section on this channel goes completely bonkers. Um, I understand. I totally do that there's less penalties called in the playoffs. But to me, it's felt like there's some more blatant stuff that doesn't get called. Or you'll see something get called. The referee puts his hand up. Okay, it's going to be a power play. But then the referee looks for something to call on the other team. And I, I have no proof of this, but it feels like the referee's going, okay, I'm that's a penalty. I have to call it. But if the other team does something too, it's four on four. And then that way it's kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not influencing the outcome. But it kind of does. Like, and it's it's one of those slippery slopes where I don't want to get into the discussion of what gets called and what doesn't and, and all that. We can talk about that in the offseason, sure. But the lack of power plays to me has really stood out this season. It feels, and again, whether it is or it isn't, it feels more pronounced this year than, than in previous years. They will call delay a game. They will call too many men on the ice, especially if you're a Bruin. They will call various penalties they have to. High sticks, blatant high sticks. When they see them, I know, Canuck fans, I know you're there. Uh, I, I know. But they don't seem to want to give power plays, which is, is odd. Because if a player breaks the rules, that should lead to a power play. And when I see officials clearly making it where it's an even up, it's, it's odd. It's really strange to me to see that. Um, and I, again, maybe maybe that's been the case for a long time. It just feels like it's more common this year than it has been before. And that there's fewer power plays for everybody. There's just fewer power plays all around. It, again, feels like. And so in the Stanley Cup Final, you may have to do something pretty bad to get a penalty. And even then, it's all likely that, uh, that the guy who's down and bleeding on the ice is going to get called for embellishment. Or get called for bleeding. You get two minutes for slashing, and he gets two minutes for bleeding. Sounds good. There you go. Made up a new rule. Um, which brings me to this one, number 10. Again. Okay, I'll, I'll, use, I'll use the eraser this time. I will, I promise. Can I write an uglier G? Oh my gosh. 
Seriously. I can edit that out, but I'm not going to. All right. Controversy is guaranteed. I, no matter what happens in the Stanley Cup final, at some point, whether... I mean, you have, you have Evander Kane on one side and Sam Bennett on the other. So right there, you have guys who've been involved in controversy in games for a while. Um, Kane's been quiet in these playoffs, though. It kind of feels like he's due for some kind of controversy. we got Corey Perry as well. Um, there's the possibility Ryan Lomberg gets into a game and maybe he gets into it and throws a hit in the corner that people don't like. But controversy is guaranteed. And sometimes it gets kind of exhausting. I do think at times it gets overblown. Um, In-game, especially some of the some of the little just ticky-tack things people get upset about. But controversy is guaranteed. There is guaranteed to be some kind of controversy in this final between Florida and Edmonton. Uh, Florida's definitely been involved in some controversies through no fault of their own. Um, and if people are going to say, well, if it's Bennett's fault. It's not Bennett's fault. He didn't get any kind of penalty or suspension for anything that's happened in these playoffs. Um, he just goes out. He plays the game. I think he knows where the line is. People have said that with him. I know people don't like hearing that. Uh, but it's the controversy is there. It's guaranteed throughout the playoffs. And it feels like that controversy, again, for me, it dates back to, I, I remember controversies in the 80s. Um, wasn't it uh, 1980, and this was the year before I started watching the, uh, the 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 Stanley Cup playoffs as much as I do? Wasn't a Bobby Nystrom goal offside, like clearly offside? I think it was an important one too. But anyways, uh, controversy goes back that far. So yeah, and that's that's why you need those offside reviews. If you'd had one back then, it might have changed the result a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it is it is guaranteed we're going to see some controversy um, in almost every team on the board's case. I think you could find some controversy in the series where they get eliminated. And uh, part of it is due to other things we see on the board in the, in the first nine uh, instances and things that I've learned in these playoffs or we've learned in these playoffs. But there you go. Top 10 list. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you've not done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.